uh, in the last class we were dealing with hypothesis testing. Hypothesis testing. We learned that we will have a few hypotheses in hand and our main objective is to identify and falsify the wrong ones. Uh, we learned that the main, main, main confounding uh, aspect in a hypothesis testing is what is known as confirmation bias. I have a hypothesis, my I believe in that hypothesis and the whole purpose of my testing is to find confirmation that the hypothesis is true. This is the worst possible mistake a scientist can make and therefore, a scientist has to conduct the experiment with a completely clean mind without any bias and therefore, the, the plan of doing the experiment has to take into account the possibility that the experimenter himself or herself could be biased and uh, therefore, we, we said that there are a few things that we build into the experimental plan. For example, we always start with believing the null hypothesis rather than the alternative hypothesis and only if we find enough evidence to believe that the null is false, then we, uh, we go in favor of the alternative hypothesis that is point number 1. So, we start by assuming or believing the null hypothesis and work out the consequence of the null hypothesis and test that rather than we rather than testing the, uh, the actual hypothesis. The second point is that we always try to do either a single blind test or in case of experimental subjects being humans double blind test. Uh, single mind because, because the uh, experimenter if he or she is biased then he or she may take the readings wrongly that possibility exists and therefore, the person who is taking the readings should not know which sample is coming from the experimental group and which sample is coming from the control group. So, that is a single blind test uh, so that there is no possibility of bias in the experimenter and the in case of the experimental subjects being humans with their own psychological uh, inclinations it is necessary that the subjects themselves also do not know whether they belong to the experimental group or the control group. And finally, after we were taking a particular example, but it is applicable almost everywhere. We took the example of drug discovery, where we took a particular disease which results in uh, some bacteria build up in the blood. So, in order to test it you would draw the blood and you would count the number of bacteria or parasite like Mendelia uh, that are there in the blood per unit volume. So, that gives a number a some kind of a numerical test of the hypothesis. So, we will try to eliminate all possibilities of confirmation bias and that way that is our method of going ahead. So, we start now with the statistical test. We have obtained from the experimental group, there is the experimental group. And there is a control group. Uh, in the experimental group and in the control group, we have initially collected samples and then we have divided them into the experimental group and the control group, but this is not necessary always that the size of the group should be exactly the same. So, let us assume that uh, this number is say n of the experimental group and this is the n of the control group. And we have uh, now, now notice that uh, as far as the 
experimental design is concerned, the way we have designed the experiment, the null hypothesis and the experimental hypothesis can be stated as I will write here. So, the null hypothesis H naught can be stated as the mean number of bacteria of bacteria uh, in the blood of the two groups. are the same. And the alternative hypothesis is that they are different. Okay. So, the mean number of bacteria in the uh, in the blood of the experimental group now we have administered the drug in the experimental group and if the drug is effective the mean number of bacteria will be less so this is the alternative hypothesis is less than that in the control group. So, this is how the, uh, the actual measured things are to be tested. Now, let us let us uh, let, let us try to try to figure out what we are actually doing there is a population of people afflicted with that disease and we have drawn we we, we are trying to figure out if we uh, apply the drug to every member of that population what will be the effect of the drug and we can think of a whole population of people who are afflicted with that disease and who have been administered with that drug that is a population of people, a large number. Now, if we can get the blood samples from all of them, then we can get definitely the actual values, but we cannot uh, get the blood sample of all of them. We have actually drawn uh, a number of samples from the population. So, there was a population, we have drawn samples and from that sample, we are trying to figure out the result. Okay. So, the point I am making is that there is a population out there. What is the character of the population? The population of people afflicted with the disease and who have been administered the drug. That is a population. There is another population of the control, control population who are afflicted with the disease, but have not been given the drug. So, there are two populations. Let me depict it this way. Suppose, we have a population of people the experimental and there is another uh, okay we, this is the population of people and within that we have drawn a sample and there is a population of people control group and we have here also drawn a sample and we actually have this data and we actually have this data but we are trying to figure out the character of the population, population of people who have the disease and who have been given the drug, population of people who have the disease and who have not been given the drug. But we are trying to make an estimate of that using a smaller sample. So, that is the problem that we have in hand. Let us define. Uh, in the experimental group, in the population, uh, in the population, there will be a, a mu mean of the experimental group. Similarly, there will be the mu of the control group. And there will be 
uh, within the experimental group there will be a standard deviation, standard deviation and there will be standard deviation in the control group. So, what does this mean? It means that if you somehow were able to take blood from all the people who are afflicted with the disease and who have been given the drug all the people then also there will be a mean there will be a standard deviation everybody will not act react to the administration of the drug in the same way. So, there will be a variation and there will be the, the mean as well as the standard deviation similarly in the control group, but we do not have that data what we actually have are in hand what we actually have in hand are the average of the experimental group and the average of the control group and the sample standard deviation of the experimental group and the stand sample standard deviation of the control group. This is what we have, uh, these are the things that we have and we are trying to figure out the character of these. So, that is the problem. Now, uh, let me erase some stuff and let me write there. Yeah. These are the things that we have in hand and these are the things that we are trying to arrive at. And what should be the test statistic? The test statistic the thing that we are trying to measure whose characteristic we are trying to test. Now, what is our really real intention? We are trying to figure out how these two groups differ and as I said we will uh, first believe in the null hypothesis and then we try to figure out if the data uh, induce us to reject the null hypothesis. What does that mean? If the null hypothesis is true, then we can we can state uh, if the null according to the to these numbers that we have obtained. So, for null hypothesis we can say that the mu e should be equal to mu c and for the alternative hypothesis we have to say that mu e is not equal to mu c. This is what we have to test ultimately all those written descriptions boil down to these numbers. So, this is what, what we are trying to test and we start with believing the null hypothesis, we start by believing the null hypothesis. Now, if the null hypothesis is true then mu e minus mu c should be equal to 0. So, if this is true therefore, we start with the assumption that the null hypothesis is true and therefore, mu e minus mu c is equal to 0 and that indicates that the difference of the two population means is the test statistic. So, test statistic is difference of the two population means that is what we have to check, but we do not really have this in hand we have x bar e and x bar c the actual measured from the smaller sample, measured values from the smaller sample. So, uh, since we do not have this in hand, what we actually have in hand is the x e bar minus x c bar that is what we have in hand. So, this is our test statistic and if I have taken a 100 samples out of that some number in the experimental group, another number in the control group, I have drawn the blood, I have counted the number of 
uh, bacteria in the blood samples per unit volume and that give has given me some value if I some value of this. If I now do the repeat uh, experiment again repeated by collecting a different sample uh, and do the same way I will get a different value of x e minus x c and the third time it will get a different value. So, this will have a distribution, but if the null hypothesis is true then the mu e minus mu c should be equal to 0 and therefore, that distribution should have a mean 0. If we take such experiments again and again every time we will get a different value of this and so we will get a distribution and that will be uh, the sampling distribution of the difference of the difference between uh, the two sample means so the distribution of this will be this distribution this is what is called now will that be a normal distribution. Now, we know that the central limit theorem says uh, let me get some space yeah the central limit theorem says says that if you conduct an experiment with at least 25 uh, data taken, data points taken, uh, then the sampling distribution of the means will be a normal distribution with mean of the normal distribution at the population mean and the standard deviation equal to the, uh, the standard deviation of the population divided by the number of uh, data points. So, let me just write it. Uh, if the sample size is greater than 25, then uh, the sampling distribution of the mean distribution of the mean sampling distribution of the mean uh, is uh, approx approximately a normal distribution with mean at the population mean and standard deviation is equal to the sigma by square root of n. This is what we learned. Now, this is for data taken, but here we are talking about a difference. Now, there exists another theorem in statistics, we are not going to the details of it, but I can state that if both these that means x e and x c both are distributed in a normal distribution, then their the difference also has a normal distribution. Okay. Now, x e will be distributed in a normal distribution is guaranteed by the fact that the number uh, n e is greater than 25 the number n c is also greater than 25. Therefore, each of these will be distributed in a normal distribution and if these are distributed in a normal distribution then the subtraction the difference will also be distributed in a normal distribution. But what will be the distribution what will be the mean of that the mean. Uh, so, let me write the difference
will um, of two normal distributed variables uh, has a normal distribution. with mean, mean will be the difference of the two means and the standard deviation, uh, this will be or I will write rather variance and variance. The first distributions variance by number e plus second distributions variance and therefore, the standard deviation S d will be square root of sigma e square by n plus c square by n. So, that will be the uh, standard deviation of the difference distribution. Okay. So, let me just repeat, if you have two variables that are each distributed in a normal distribution, then their difference is also distributed in a normal distribution with mean at the, the difference between the two means of the two distributions and the variance equal to this. Now, this is all very good. So, we have we are sort of uh, uh, guaranteed that we are dealing with a normal distribution, but we do not have this value, we do not have this value, but we know that if the, the null hypothesis is true that we started with, then this value is 0, which means that these quantities, uh, let me write this x e bar minus x c bar. If you make repeated observations of these will be distributed in a normal distribution. with mean 0 and why mean is 0 because 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 this is true this is 0 because we have started by believing the null hypothesis if the null hypothesis is true then it is 0 and standard deviation Now, that gives us a way of testing, because if it is a normal distribution, if it is a normal distribution like this, if it is a normal distribution like this, then and with mean 0 and the standard deviation equal to this. Then we know that uh, 95 percent of this area lies 95 percent of this area, 95 percent of the area lies within plus or minus 1.96 standard deviation. And since we know the standard deviation, we can find out uh, within what range will 95 percent uh, remain now. If the value that I have got 
value of x e minus x c, this value that I have got is beyond this, then it is a very unlikely thing to happen because 95 percent of the time this will be in this range, in this range. Only 5 percent of the time it has any possibility of being outside and if I have got this value then it is a reasonably good uh, uh, evidence that the null hypothesis is wrong. If the null hypothesis is true then this would be the distribution and then it would be very unlikely to get a value which is beyond this range of confidence. So, if I get a value which is beyond this range of confidence, then we can have a 95 percent confidence in saying that the null hypothesis is false. Otherwise, we will say that we do not have sufficient evidence to reject the null hypothesis. So, that is the essential logical structure. So, uh, one problem we still have that is we do not have the values of these because these are something that belongs to the population. We have the sample values, but as always we will substitute this the population values by the sample values. So, that we get something uh, in number and if the n is large n is large sorry this would be the n e and this would be n c sorry. If the ends are large, uh, then more or less this assumption is a valid assumption. So, we estimate the standard error. So, estimated standard error estimated standard error will be. Uh, the square root of we we'll substitute this by S e square by number of e plus S small s S c square by the number of the control group. So, that is the estimated standard error. So, that is the E S e. And we are trying to find out that will be the standard deviation of this distribution. Okay. Now, we are trying to find out whether the data I have got is beyond 1.96 ESE. And the, the general way of doing it is to define uh, we will reject the uh, we uh, okay, general way of define is, is to define the z z is equal to what we have got x e bar minus x c bar by the estimated standard error. And then we will reject the null hypothesis is if z is very large. So, uh, reject the null if uh, z is below minus 1.96 or z is above 1.96. This is the this is the standard test of the hypothesis where we are saying that with 95 percent confidence we can reject the null hypothesis or we cannot reject the null hypothesis with a 95 percent confidence. So, the 95 percent confidence is the yardstick and as I have said in different fields you need you might need different extents of confidence depending on that you will have to set this number, but in general for 95 percent confidence this is uh, 1.96. Okay. Let me uh, give an example to illustrate how this is actually done. 